So I am going to uh, talk today about influenza evolution. And uh, so I have this fairly specific title here, uh, Stability Mediated Epistasis Constrains the Evolution of an Influenza Protein. And I'll kind of explain uh, what that means as we go into the talk. But first, uh, I'd like to thank the people who've done most of the work that I'm going to talk about. Ian Gong in my lab has done almost all of these experiments. And since my lab has only been around here for a little over a year, he's a remarkably prolific guy, as you're going to see. And then we also have a collaboration with Mark Suchard, who's at the medical school at UCLA, who's helped us develop some of the computational techniques that go into the research that I'll be discussing. Uh, so sort of as way of background to sort of motivate the question that I'm going to be discussing, I'd like to go back to an analogy which was originally introduced by in this paper in Nature in 1970 by John Maynard Smith, who's a famous evolutionary biologist. And in this paper, uh, Maynard Smith was talking about, at a very conceptual level, how proteins or viruses evolve. And he introduced the following analogy as a good way to think about the evolution, for example, of a protein coding gene. And he basically compared this molecular evolution to this word game, which many of you may have heard of and played, where you have to convert one word, so in this case we're starting with the word word, into another word, in which case we're ending here with the word gene, and you have to change it one letter at a time, and you have to change it in such a way that each of the intermediate steps along the way is also a valid word in the English language. And this sort of captures what Maynard Smith was positing was a fundamental feature of molecular evolution, and that it occurs through the accumulation of numerous small changes, and that at each step along the way, the gene or protein has to be doing something functional, because that's necessary for it to sort of give rise to progeny. And if you think about this analogy, an interesting thing, at least in the analogy, is if we look at the four mutations that eventually occur here, and we ask, what if each of those mutations occurred by itself, what you see, again, at least in the analogy, is that three of the four mutations, so the three I've shown here in red, would not have been acceptable mutations if they'd happened in the original sequence. And so the ability of these mutations to occur depended on other mutations that occurred before them. So anyway, this is a nice analogy, and it's going to kind of frame the question I want to talk about. And what I want to talk about is how much does this sort of phenomenon actually true for the real evolution of proteins and viruses? Because although this is a good analogy, we don't know if the same rules that govern whether something is a word in the English language govern whether something is really a functional protein or gene. So to sort of introduce some of the terminology, in Maynard Smith's analogy here, epistasis constrains the accessible evolutionary trajectories. And epistasis is the phenomenon where the impact or effect of one mutation depends on whether or not other mutations have occurred. So for example, this W to G mutation here is allowed in this context, but not in this context, because there's some sort of epistasis between this mutation and this mutation. So this is the phenomenon that we're going to be looking at. Uh, and like I said, we want to talk about how much is this the case for real protein evolution, and then can we understand the rules for real protein evolution in the same way that we can all sort of intuitively understand the rules for this game. So the goal experiment that we would like to do to answer this question is to take an influenza virus and take a gene in that virus and reconstruct how that gene has actually changed over an extended period of evolutionary time. So there's been a mutation and that was followed by another mutation, and another mutation, and so on. And if we can reconstruct how an influenza gene has changed in this way, we could then experimentally also introduce these mutations in an artificial way, where we now take the mutations out of the sequence in which they actually occurred, and put them individually into the original parent virus. And we could look functionally at these viruses, and if we see something like this, where we see mutation three was able to occur along this evolutionary trajectory, but it's deleterious by itself, then we know that there are indeed some sort of interesting epistatic interactions during the evolutionary process. So in my lab, we work on influenza. And influenza is interesting for a large number of reasons. I'm not going to talk about all those reasons today. I'm just going to tell you why it's a good system to answer the question that I was just posing. So influenza, as you know, in humans is a respiratory virus. It's a, a negative sense segmented RNA virus. And 
this virus evolves very, very rapidly. So here's a phylogenetic tree of two species with which we're both familiar, the human and the pig. And we know that the human and the pig had some common ancestor at some deep point in the past. We think that was about 90 million years ago. And if we compare the proteins that are shared between the human and the pig, those proteins are now about 89% identical. Unfortunately, from the perspective of evolutionary biology, we do not know in great detail what this common ancestor looked like or how this common ancestor got to the human or the pig. So influenza evolves about a million times more rapidly than a vertebrate like a human or a pig. So for example, many of the influenza genes that are present in humans today derived from the 1918 influenza pandemic. And what we believe happened in that pandemic is we believe that an avian virus transmitted shortly before 1918 into either a human or a pig. It's not clear which one. But starting around 1918, this virus caused concurrent pandemics in both humans and pigs. And many of the genes from this virus have been evolving in pigs ever since 1918. And they've also been evolving in humans ever since 1918. And so over this 90 year time span, we can look and we can say how different have these proteins become. And we see that the proteins in the pig descendants of the 1918 virus and the human descendants of the 1918 virus from influenza are actually as different as the human and the pig itself. So this virus is evolving very rapidly. And importantly, from the perspective of the evolutionary biology of this process, people have been sequencing influenza viruses, both from humans and from pigs, through much of this time frame. So we know a lot about how the virus changed at a molecular level. And since this is really a lot of evolution, in my talk, I'm just going to focus in on sort of a subsection of this evolution, which is the evolution of human H3N2 influenza from 1968 to 2007, so a 39-year time span. So here is now a more detailed phylogenetic tree showing a specific influenza protein, the nucleoprotein, or NP, and I'll talk in a little bit more detail about that protein in a minute, and how it's changed from 1968 to 2007. So along the x-axis here is time, and each of these little lines in white here represents an influenza isolate for which the nucleoprotein has been sequenced. And they're, they're arranged in a phylogenetic tree here. So you can see that uh, there's sort of a trunk to this phylogenetic tree, and we can trace along that trunk from a particular virus isolate from 1968, the IACHI 1968 nucleoprotein, to a more recent virus, the Brisbane 2007 virus. And when we trace along there, uh, that corresponds to some particular sequence of mutations that occurred along this line of descent. So the protein that I'm going to be talking about today to give a little bit more background is the nucleoprotein of influenza. So if we were to sort of imagine looking more carefully at some of these droplets that are emanating from this gentleman, and this is now an electron micrograph of an influenza virus, so it's about 150 nanometers in diameter. And if we were to imagine zooming in more carefully on one of these viruses, what we would expect to see is something like this. So here's the influenza envelope. Inserted in this envelope are the two dominant surface antigens of influenza, the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase protein. And inside the virus are a number of other proteins. Uh, and one of these proteins, which is the one that I'm going to be talking about today, is called the nucleoprotein. And the nucleoprotein, if we were again to imagine looking more carefully, is sort of a constituent of the virus's RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So Influenza is a negative sense RNA virus, so the RNA is wrapped around this nucleoprotein, which is represented by these little spheres here. And then on the end of this sit three proteins that have catalytic activity and catalyze the transcription of this viral RNA. So this allows us to perform some very simple assays to look at the biochemical function of the nucleoprotein. In particular, one of the things we can do is we can take these three polymerase proteins, here labeled PB2, PB1, and PA, and along with the nucleoprotein, co-transfect all of these into human cell lines. And if we also put in a green fluorescent reporter protein, where that green fluorescent protein is encoded on a negative sense influenza viral RNA, by itself, that protein is not transcribed into messenger RNA by the cell because it's negative sense. But if all of these influenza proteins are there, they collaborate together to transcribe the viral RNA into messenger RNA which the cell then translates into protein, and the cells turn green. So for example, just looking here under microscopy, we can see that if we take these three proteins from a 1995 strain of influenza, and we put in nucleoproteins that derive from 1968, 1995, and 2007, we all get high levels of this green fluorescent protein. But if we don't put in any nucleoprotein, 
we don't get any green fluorescent protein. And we use flow cytometry to quantify this signal to see how, how much activity or how functional this nuclear protein is. So to sort of take one more step back to think about the nuclear protein, we think this protein is doing two things during the natural evolution of the virus. One of these things is it's under very strong selection to maintain its essential role in viral RNA transcription. That's what I just described to you, and that's something we can measure in the lab. We also think that this protein is under continual pressure to escape from the immunity that builds up in the human population. And in the case of the nuclear protein, since it's an internal protein uh, of the virus, we believe that the strongest form of immune pressure is cellular immunity, uh, particularly CD8 T cells, which target this protein. And although we are not able to directly measure uh, that in the lab, uh, because it depends on a lot of complex uh, factors in a human, including HLA type and immune history, there's a lot of existing data, which I will refer to later in the talk, that allows us to estimate what parts of this protein are being targeted by the immune memory in the human population. So that's sort of the background. Now I'm going to go back to our goal experiment. And recall our goal experiment is we want to both look at how this protein has naturally changed over time, and then we want to sort of synthetically or artificially introduce each of these mutations individually into the parent virus, this virus from 1968, and see what they do by themselves. And in order to do that, we have to first reconstruct how the virus actually changed. So I showed you a phylogenetic tree a minute ago. And what we've done is we've converted the information in that phylogenetic tree into what I'm just going to call an evolutionary map. And what this map shows is how we think this virus actually evolved. So down here is the final virus, the Brisbane 2007 virus. We know the sequence of that virus. And based on the many thousands of influenza sequences that are available, we can say with very high confidence that the parent of this virus here is this circle here, which differs by a single mutation. The parent of this virus here is this virus. There are places where, because of a lack of sequence information and because of rapid influenza evolution, we can't tell exactly which way evolution went. So here, we know this sequence existed, and we know this sequence existed, but we don't know which order these two mutations occurred. But in general, we can build up a pretty good map of how this protein evolved. And if we zoom out and build up the whole map for the 39-year time span, you see something like this. And obviously, I don't expect you guys to absorb everything that's in here, but the key point is most of these mutations, which are shown in white, we can map exactly when they occurred during the evolution of the virus. In a few cases, there are mutations, such as this case shown in red here, where there were several mutations that occurred relatively close together in time and we don't have enough information to tell which one actually occurred first. But there are a total of 39 mutations here. It actually turns out you can arrange 39 mutations into 10 to the 46th different possible combinations. So the fact that we're able to narrow that down pretty well to the actual evolutionary path is, is sort of a testament to how much influenza sequence information is out there. So that allows us to sort of reconstruct this yellow part of this goal experiment. So what I'm now going to show you is the actual data when we do this experiment. We take the virus from 1968 and we sequentially add all of these 39 mutations that occurred over this time span. So we did that and then we measured the transcriptional activity of all these mutants. The y-axis here is a normalized uh, scale and 1 is the value we measure for the wild type. So what you see here is that all of these naturally occurring influenza variants have high transcriptional activity. They're all highly functional. And that's sort of what we expected to see. If you remember back to the analogy I showed at the beginning of the talk, we believe that evolution proceeds through functional intermediates. And these mutations accumulate in a way that none of them hurt the virus that badly. So, so that's sort of what we're confirming here. So this is not that surprising. The interesting part is now when we go to this experiment, where we're now putting these mutations in an artificial context. We're taking all of these mutations that naturally occurred here without any deleterious effect, and we're introducing them each into the virus from 1968 as individual mutations. So when we do that, we didn't know what to expect, but what we ended up finding was something that was quite interesting. So now the x-axis here is just showing all of these mutations roughly in the order that they occurred. And you can see that many of these mutations, when you make them individually to the virus, you still have relatively high activity. So they don't seem to be that deleterious to the virus. But there are three mutations here, here, and here, which are strongly deleterious when you make them by themselves to the virus. Even though, in the natural evolution, these mutations somehow ended up being incorporated into the viral genome without any deleterious effect. 
So to go back, there are a couple of interesting questions you can ask about these mutations. First, you can ask, how did they get into the virus? What was sort of the historical process that allowed this to happen? And I'm going to address that question uh, in a second. You can also ask, what was the mechanistic basis for this historical process? So what were these mutations doing at a molecular level? And I'll also address that. But the first question I want to ask is, is there anything unusual about these three mutations that sort of make them different from the rest of the mutations? And so again, we have these three mutations that I'm going to call epistatically constrained because they were hard for the virus to get. Something else had to change in order for them to be incorporated. And is there anything special about them? Well, as I told you, the nucleoprotein is one of the primary targets of the CD8 T cell response in influenza-infected humans. And so what we're able to do is because there's been a lot of uh, sort of prior experimental work on characterizing CD8 T cell epitopes and in influenza proteins, we are able to sort of mine through all of that information and say what sites in the nucleoprotein are in the dominant human CD8 T cell epitopes in common HLA types. And that's what this graph here shows. So on the x-axis here is the number of CTL epitopes. So we expect sites that are in more CTL epitopes are going to sort of be more important for viral immune escape. And if you just look at any position in the nucleoprotein, so I'm basically saying you put on a blindfold and you grab some random site out of the nucleoprotein, you get this blue curve here where only a small number of them are in, in lots of CD8 T cell epitopes. If you now just restrict yourself to the 39 sites that changed during the evolution of this virus from 1968 to 2007, you get this red curve here. And so you see that this red curve is actually not very different than the blue curve. What this indicates is that most of the mutations that are happening in the nucleoprotein do not appear to be significant CD8 T cell escape mutations. And that again actually corresponds to what we think is the case for influenza because we think the primary driver of influenza evolution is antibodies, not T cells. But then I told you that experimentally we identified three mutations which occurred at amino acid 280, 259, and 384 that were under this strong epistatic constraint. So these were somehow sort of very difficult mutations for the virus to acquire. And if you look at those mutations, you can see that they are in sites which do have lots of CD8 T cell epitopes. And in fact, if you do a statistical test, you see that these three mutations occur in sites which are statistically significantly enriched in CD8 T cell epitopes relative to all of the mutated sites from this time frame or all of the sites altogether. So we can now say, yes, there is something special about these epistatically constrained mutations. They appear to be disproportionately important for viral immune escape. And I'm going to sort of come back to what we think that means later. But it's showing that there is some significance uh, to sort of the difficult to get mutations with the virus still ends up acquiring. So to sort of summarize what I've said so far in the talk, this is a schematic picture which describes what I've been talking about. We believe that there are viral genes here. And they can get mutations which have no effect on fitness. They can get mutations which are deleterious on fitness. And we believe that in some cases, because I've shown you this, there are mutations where you add up the two mutations and the combination has a different effect than the mutations individually. So for example, I described these three CD8 T cell escape mutations, which individually were highly deleterious to the virus, but yet they were somehow able to fix during its evolution. And we believe that actually increased the fitness of the virus because not only could it still replicate well, it was now better able to escape from pre-existing immunity. So what we want to ask now is how did the virus end up getting from here to here? You can imagine two paths it could have taken. It could have taken a path like this, where it sort of goes through a fitness valley, or it could have taken a path like this, where it sort of goes around a fitness valley. It never suffers any negative impact. So what is the evolutionary pathway? So here we can now go back to this evolutionary map that we're able to build for this virus. And on this evolutionary map, which shows all of these 39 mutations, we can draw arrows to indicate where each of these three epistatically constrained CD8 T cell escape mutations occurred. And then we can zoom in on the portion of the map and do some experiments to figure out what actually happened. So the first mutation that I'm going to talk about is L259S. So if we look at the map here, these maps take a little while to get used to looking at, but what, what the sort of the relevant portions are indicated here by the 10 and the 12. There were a variety of mutations that happened in this virus, and we ended up with a virus which I've here labeled step 10. And then this virus got the L259S mutation 
and the N334H mutation in some unresolved order, we can't tell which mutation happened first, and ended up creating this other virus here called STEP12. So when we look at the virus from 1968, it has high, act its nuclear protein is highly functional. The L259S mutation is highly de detrimental to that protein. This is what I've already described. And this N334H mutation doesn't really have any effect. It appears to be neutral. Now we look at this STEP10, this naturally existing virus, also had a highly functional nuclear protein. When you make the L259S mutation to this virus, it's still deleterious. It's now not quite as bad as it was in 1968, but it's still deleterious. And you make the N334H mutation, and it doesn't appear to have any effect. But when you combine these two mutations together, you now rescue the function of the nucleoprotein back to approximately wild-type levels. So what happened here is in, in very short time, within about six months, the virus got both of these mutations, one of which was able to rescue the deleterious effect of the other. When we go to the next mutation, which is called R384G, what we see is as follows. The virus proceeded through this, this virus here, which was called STEP20. STEP20 got a mutation which was actually the reversion of L259S. So it reverted away the first detrimental mutation to give this next virus STEP21, which then got several mutations, including this R384G change, which by itself is deleterious. So here we see that R384G was bad for the virus in 1968. It's also bad for STEP20 right here, although not quite as bad. After the L259S mutation reverts, this R384G mutation is no longer deleterious. So when you make R384G here, it's not bad. And when you combine it with all these other mutations and go to here, you also have a highly functional protein. So here, something changed prior to the occurrence of R384G that allowed the virus to tolerate that mutation. And in fact, that change was this right here. The third mutation, we see a similar story to the one I just told you about. This mutation, V280A, is bad for the virus by itself in 1968. But when you make it in the parent in which it actually occurs, shown right here, it's no longer deleterious. And in fact, it turns out the mutation that occurred directly before that change, this mutation M136I, can largely rescue the effect of V280A. So again, there were changes before the occurrence of this epistatically constrained CD8 T cell escape mutation that allowed it to occur. So to summarize what happened, in two cases, we can definitively say that evolution proceeded like this. There were what I'm going to call permissive changes, which are represented by this green circle, so mutations which in and of themselves had no real effect but enabled the virus to tolerate an otherwise deleterious mutation. So two of three cases definitely went like this. In the third case, we simply don't have enough evolutionary information to tell if it happened like this or if it happened like this. So in order to sort of uh, elaborate a little bit more on this, we want to ask, what is the mechanism of these mutations? How is this green mutation enabling this orange mutation to fix in the viral genome without a fitness effect? So the first thing we did uh, is look at where these mutations are located on the structure of the nucleoprotein. So shown here in gray is the crystal structure of this protein, and all of these mutations are mapped onto that crystal structure. And so at least what I took away from this slide or this, this image when we, when we generated it is there's nothing obvious. You know, if these mutations were touching each other or something like that, you might be able to come up with a story. But as it is, none of these mutations are in contact in the structure. And there's nothing obvious that jumps out from looking at this. So we then came up with another hypothesis, which was that these mutations might be rescuing each other not because they're contacting in the protein structure, but because they're affecting the stability of this structure. And so our first experiment to test that hypothesis was as follows. I've previously told you that we identified three individually deleterious mutations, L259S, V280A, and R384G. And that L259S occurred at the same time as another mutation, N334H, which by itself had no effect, but was able to rescue the deleterious effect of L259S. So we added this N334H mutation to each of the other deleterious mutations and found that in both cases, it was also able to rescue their effect on the function of this protein. So this N334H mutation is somehow a globally rescuing mutation. It's able to rescue all of these deleterious mutations. So our hypothesis was, well, maybe that has to do with the stability of this protein. So we then used Western blotting to look at the amount of nucleoprotein 
in cells that were transfected with this protein. If you transfect cells with the wild type gene, there's a lot of protein. If you transfect it with this N334H mutation, there's a lot of protein. But if you transfect it with each of these three mutations which are deleterious to activity, you also see a large decrease in the amount of nucleoprotein. However, when you add this N334H mutation to each of these deleterious mutations, your protein levels go back up. And in fact, if you quantify that Western blot and repeat the experiment a couple of times, you see that the changes in activity are explained almost entirely simply by changes in the level of the protein that is present in these cells. So we then further hypothesized that these changes in protein level actually had to do with the thermal stability of this nucleoprotein. And that this N334H mutation, although it has no phenotypic effect when you just look at function, might actually be making this protein more stable so that it can then tolerate other mutations which might make it less stable. So this is our hypothesis. To test this hypothesis, we actually had to purify the nucleoprotein by itself so we could then denature the thing uh, by thermal denaturation and see how stable it was. So for those of you who are protein chemistry aficionados, we ended up coming up with a procedure to purify the nucleoprotein from bacteria with a epitope tag. We were then able to run the protein over a size exclusion column, which is shown here. And what you can see is uh, our ladder is in yellow and our actual proteins chromatogram here is in light blue. And you can see we get a nice peak. So we're able to get high levels of very pure nucleoprotein. We also needed a mechanism or a method to look and see if the protein was folded. So to do that, we use CD or circular dichroism. And so as some of you may know, proteins, when they're folded, polarize light. And so here you can see when we take our folded protein and put it at, and keep it at 20 degrees and look at the light polarization by circular dichroism, you can see that we get this signal which is characteristic of a folded protein. If we do the same experiment on just buffer, we get this more or less straight line shown here in yellow. When we take our folded protein and we heat it up to 95 degrees, so that's this purple curve here, it no longer is polarizing light. The signal goes away because the protein has unfolded. And then in fact, when we cool it back down, there's still no signal. So once this thing unfolds, it's done for. It doesn't refold. So what that allows us to do is now heat it up gradually and monitor this, this light polarization signal at 209 nanometers. And what we see, and this is for the wild type protein, is that when we heat this thing up, there's a lot of uh, signal, so it's well folded, it's well folded, and then at a temperature somewhere around 41 or 42 degrees, the protein starts to unfold, and the midpoint of this transition is about 42 degrees. So the thermal stability of the wild type protein is about 42 degrees. We then repeated this experiment for the mutants that I've been telling you about, and what we see is summarized here. So this N334H mutation, this mutation which by itself doesn't seem to be doing anything, because it doesn't change the intracellular protein levels or the activity, actually is nonetheless increasing the thermal stability of this protein by a lot. So the melting temperature is increased to about 49 degrees. These three individually deleterious mutations, on the other hand, decrease the thermal stability of this protein. But when you add the stabilizing mutation back, their stabilities go up to wild type or greater than wild type levels. So here's the mental picture that we've sort of tried to synthesize from all of these experiments. We believe that this plot sort of represents a relationship between the thermal stability of this protein and its sort of contribution to viral fitness, which is to say that the protein has to have some minimal amount of stability, which appears to be something like 41 or 42 degrees, in order to remain well folded in its actual environment, which is a human cell. If you destabilize the protein beyond that level, and so that's what, for example, this L259S mutation does, the protein then is starting to be turned over and degraded in the cell. So that causes a reduction in protein level, as I showed you with Western blotting. It causes a reduction in the total activity, as I showed you. And it also causes a reduction in viral growth, which I didn't really show you for, uh, for reasons of not wanting to overload you with data, but is also something we were able to measure. You can also make the protein more stable, like this N334H mutation does. But that actually doesn't have any phenotypic effect if the protein is already stable enough, because it was already well folded. So now it's sort of more well folded, but that, doesn't, that doesn't, doesn't do anything. But that does, once you add this N334H mutation, you can then get a destabilizing mutation like this L259S change. So overall, what we believe is happening during the evolution of this protein is there's a stabilizing mutation, 
like this N334H change, which allows this otherwise deleterious CD8 T cell escape mutation to occur. After some period of time, there's another stabilizing mutation. So in this case, it was actually reversion of the first one. And then that allows the second CD8 T cell escape mutation to occur. After a while, there's another stabilizing mutation, in this case, M136I, along with another smaller contribution from some other mutations, which then allows another destabilizing mutation to occur. So all of this sort of complex patterns of epistasis we were seeing in our data seems to be largely explained just by this hidden variable of protein thermal stability. And so sort of going forward, this now suggests something that's of great interest to us, which is sort of can we identify these viruses, which sort of have this enhanced evolutionary capacity? Because if you were to just look out there at the influenza viruses that exist, this virus right here, which was our wild type virus from 1968, and this virus, which is the one with the N334H mutation, look the same. They're both functional viruses. But based on what I've described to you, we know that these viruses differ in their capacity for future evolutionary change. Because these, these ones here, we have shown, can tolerate additional destabilizing mutations, which can potentially aid an immune escape. So is there a way to actually sort of identify these viruses that are out there so we can sort of predict what are the mutations or what are the viral variants which would have enhanced capacity for future evolutionary change? So if we're going to do something like that, we need a better method of identifying the stabilizing mutations than what I've described to you so far. Because what I've described to you so far involved a lot of work. It involved purifying these proteins, doing thermal denaturation. That's not something that you can easily do for the many thousands of possible mutations to an influenza virus. So we've spent a lot of time thinking about how you could predict these stabilizing mutations, which appear to increase future evolutionary capacity, in a much easier manner. And there's nothing obvious to us when we look at the structure. So we haven't really had a lot of success with structure-based prediction. So we're instead trying an approach which has been very much inspired by Doug Fowler and Stan Fields, who are a couple of my colleagues in the Genome Sciences Department. And this, this approach takes advantage of an area which is sort of an approach which has gotten a lot easier to do in recent molecular biology, and that's to do sequencing. And so what you can conceptually imagine doing is you can imagine taking a gene for a wild type influenza protein and you can mutate that thing randomly, for example, by error prone PCR. And then if you grow viruses from this pool of mutants, you're not going to get out all of the mutant genes that you put in because some of these mutations are deleterious to the virus and are going to be eliminated by natural selection. So there's going to be some selection that goes on here. And then if you were able to sequence all of these, it, very high depth, what you would see when you sequence your wild type gene, you just measure your sequencing error rate. When you sequence here, you, you measure sort of the mutations that you introduce. And when you measure here, you're measuring what are the mutations that can survive the selection. So what are the mutations that are tolerated? And when we go back to this picture I've presented now, which is our conceptual way of thinking about how these mutations interact, we can now start to make some expectations about what we would expect if we did that experiment. So if a mutation increases the stability of this protein, based on what we've seen in the experiment so far, we expect that that mutation will be tolerated. So that mutation would still be present after we select for viable viruses. Furthermore, that mutation will actually increase the virus's capacity for future mutations. And so since many of these viruses are getting multiple mutations, this mutation will actually go up in frequency because not only is it tolerated by itself, it also allows other partners to come along. On the other hand, if a mutation decreases the stability of this protein, it's going to go down in frequency because that mutation will tend to be bad for the, the, the virus and it will only survive if it sort of gets lucky and happens at the same time as a stabilizing mutation. In other words, if we were to plot the change in stability, which is this sort of difficult thing to measure, versus the enrichment after we do this experiment. So here what we're plotting is after we make the random mutations and then select for the viruses that can grow, what are the mutations that go up in frequency and what are the mutations that go down in frequency? What we expect to see is that the stabilizing mutations will go up in frequency because they are tolerated by themselves and they're increasing the tolerance to subsequent mutations. Mutations that have no effect on stability will stay at about the same frequency 
because they're not doing anything to the tolerance for future mutations. And destabilizing mutations will go down in frequency because they can only survive if they get lucky and happen with a stabilizing mutation. So we've now done this sort of experiment using the deep sequencing. And when we map on the mutations for which we've already experimentally characterized their effect on stability, we see this nice relationship here. So we have three destabilizing mutations. One of them involves two nucleotide mutations to the same codon, so it doesn't show up in our, in our sequencing. But the other two are down in frequency a lot. We have one mutation without much effect on stability. It's about present the same amount before and after the selection. And then we have one mutation which increases the stability, and it actually goes up in frequency. So the cool part of this is not that we were able to recapitulate these four mutations for which we've actually done the experiment. The cool part is when we do the deep sequencing, we are looking at all of the possible single mutations you can make to the virus. So we're now generating data for thousands and thousands of potential mutations to this nucleoprotein. In particular, we see that there are many other mutations that lie in this realm up here. When we do this experiment, they go up in frequency. So we now believe that these are mutations that are candidates for also stabilizing this protein and perhaps also sort of enabling its future evolution. And so right now we're working to test some of those mutations. So to sort of sum up the conclusions from this talk, I've talked about this phenomenon of epistasis during the evolution of influenza, where you can get mutations that may have non-additive effects on the fitness of the virus. And we've seen that this does in fact occur. We looked at a 40-year time span of influenza evolution, and we found three mutations which were important for immune escape and which needed other mutations to help rescue their effect on fitness. I've showed you that the historical process tends to go like this. We tend to see a permissive change happen first, which by itself has little effect, but then enables a subsequent change. And so this is what gives us this hope that prediction may be possible. I've shown you that the dominant mechanism here is actually something that we can understand and measure in the lab. It's stabilizing mutations and destabilizing mutations, which is something that in principle and in practice can be measured. And then I've shown you that because those experiments are hard to do, we think, anyway, we have preliminary data that suggests it may be possible to comprehensively identify what are the stabilizing and destabilizing mutations without doing quite as much experimental work as went into the, to what I've described here. And then one of the areas that we're sort of excited about trying to move forward to in the future is can we use these insights and approaches to study some of the more medically relevant aspects of influenza evolution. And in particular, what we're interested in studying there is the antigenic evolution of influenza hemagglutinin. So as many of you know, uh, the predominant mechanism of immunity against influenza is believed to be antibodies which target the hemagglutinin, which is the dominant protein on the surface of the virus. And uh, unfortunately, that hemagglutinin protein evolves very rapidly, which is why the influenza vaccine must constantly be updated, and which is why a viral infection does not provide lifelong immunity uh, against influenza. And so a major question in, for example, influenza vaccine design is can we predict which viruses are likely to predominate in future years because there's a period of time that's required in order to prepare the influenza vaccine. And we believe that some of the work I've described here provides some insights into which viral strains have the evolutionary potential for future antigenic evolution. So we believe that this sort of more mechanistic and molecular understanding of influenza evolution can eventually be applied to selecting strains for the influenza vaccine. And so I'd like to give some thanks for people who did the work and aided in the work I've described here. So as I mentioned, Ian from my lab did most of the experiments that I've presented. And Mark Suchard at UCLA helped us with a lot of the uh, computational work. The work that I was discussing at the end, the sort of deep sequencing approach, was very much inspired and also aided by Doug Fowler and Stan Fields at the University of Washington. And then two of my colleagues at the Fred Hutch, uh, Roland Strong and Colin in his lab, and then Barry Stoddard and Jill in his lab helped us a lot with the protein purification and the thermal denaturation. So thanks for your time, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that anyone might have. So the functional assay that you have for the nuclear protein, do you have a similar assay that you could use for human gluten? Is it that, is it that important for viral function? Yeah, so this is, a, this is a really good question. I talked at the, the end of my, my presentation how we would like to apply some of these same things to look at the evolution of influenza hemagglutinin. And the question was, do we have a good assay for hemagglutinin function? Uh, so we have assays for hemagglutinin function anyway. So the reason we initially did our experiments on the nucleoprotein, which is sort of on the inside of the virus, is that we believe that what we can do in tissue culture 
which is sort of grow the virus in human cells, uh, is very representative of growth in humans for the nuclear protein, because in both cases, it's in the nucleus transcribing RNA. The hemagglutinin, we can make mutations to the hemagglutinin and look to see how well does the virus grow in tissue culture. And that's sort of representative of what the virus has to do in humans, but it's not fully representative because in humans, there are a lot of things that aren't present in tissue culture that are affecting the exterior environment of the humans, things like antibodies and mucus and lectins and all sorts of things like that. So uh, we do have tissue culture assays, which we're pursuing, but we're less enthusiastic about their ability to really measure the relevant properties that are going on in, in nature. So we're also looking at possibilities of actually doing the entire experiment in mice, which are still not going to be a perfect model, but are going to be a much better model. So we, we certainly have ways of measuring the antigenicity of hemagglutin, and those are well established. Our methods for measuring the function of hemagglutin in a way that we think fully recapitulates the natural contribution of the protein to viral fitness. We have some assays, but we're working on trying to make them better. So we have enough to get going, but that's an area we're definitely interested in improving. Uh, any further questions? Related also to the hemagglutinin question, do you think that they co-evolve? Does, does the nuclear protein in some way reflect what's going on with evolution on the outside? Is there any? So, yeah, so, so right, there are, the, there are eight influenza genes. Which, so the question was, does the nuclear protein, which is on the inside of influenza, co-evolve with the hemagglutinin? So certainly, in principle, that could happen. And it, in the whole talk, I've talked about mutations within a viral protein interacting with each other. We also certainly believe there's a potential for mutations in one viral protein to interact with mutations in another viral protein. So I can't rule out interactions between the nuclear protein and the hemagglutinin, but we haven't seen any evidence of that. And mechanistically, I think it's, it's less likely. Probably the main uh, sort of coevolution is happening between the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase, which are both on the surface because the hemagglutinin binds to the receptor and then the neuraminidase later cleaves the receptor. So there's, there has to be a balance between those two proteins. Uh, so I don't think that there's a lot of interaction between the nuclear protein and the hemagglutinin. I can't rule out there being some, but I don't think it's, it's sort of a dominant thing. But certainly when you start looking at the hemagglutinin, I think there's an increasing potential for interactions between mutations in the hemagglutinin and mutations in the neuraminidase. And there has been work by other groups sort of looking at that sort of phenomenon. So it, it, it's interesting to think about how deterministic some of these pathways might be. I mean, if there's a very strong advantage in immune escape first, you know, these three mutations you pointed out, is there evidence that they happened independently many times in populations with an HLA haplotype that conferred that advantage? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. That's another very good question. So the, the, the question uh, for people who couldn't hear it is sort of how deterministic uh, is this evolutionary process in general? And for example, these sorts of uh, immune escape mutations, do they arise many, many times independently, or do they just happen to arise once and then take over? Uh, so the degree to which the evolution is due to sort of deterministic factors, you know, this mutation is definitely the best one, and random factors, this mutation just happened to occur, is sort of a, a hard question to answer. I would say that there's actually probably my intuition, and this is not really based on any sort of hard evidence because I don't know how to look at this, there's actually probably a lot more randomness than you would expect. Because even though there's a lot of influenza viruses out there and they're subject to very strong selection, probably many of the mutations in nuclear protein are getting fixed by random chance. In particular, and this sort of goes back to the previous question, although I don't think there's a mechanistic interaction between the nuclear protein and hemagglutinin mutations very often, there is a potential for evolutionary hitchhiking where you have a virus, it gets a mutation in hemagglutinin, which is now helping it evade the antibody immunity a little bit better. And then you also happen to get a mutation in nuclear protein, which isn't doing much. But since that virus is better because of the mutation in hemagglutinin, the mutation in the nuclear protein kind of hitchhikes along for the ride and ends up spreading. Uh, as far as emerging humans, we don't have, there isn't none of the, although there are a lot of influenza sequences available, there's no data at this point saying what HLA type that person had. So we can't really answer that question. Certainly in HIV, where there's a lot more data linking particular viral sequences and particular HLA types. And also, I should mention the, the CD8 T cell response is probably much more potent against HIV, and the infection lasts a lot longer, so there's a lot more time for escape. But certainly there, there are, are, is some degree of 
recurrent mutations which will tend to happen in cer certain HLA types. But for influenza, we don't have the data to answer that question yet. So I, 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 my personal view is probably a lot of this evolution is stochastic. And if you somehow went back to 1968 and did the whole thing again, you might end up with some of the same mutations, but there'd probably be a lot of different ones, which obviously makes predicting things much harder. Did you look at the RNA stability or readability of your mutants, or are you convinced that the fitness is all due to yeah. protein stability? Yeah, it's another good question. So you can imagine, in principle, a lot of ways that these mutations could be affecting the fitness of the protein, one of which could they could be ex affecting mRNA stability. So we can't rule out that that doesn't change. We feel like, however, we, you know, we were able to identify three mutations which were strongly deleterious in this experiment we did. And all of them, we can adequately explain what happens by looking at changes in protein stability. So I guess I would say that that indicates that probably mRNA stability is not that important in this context, or none of the mutations are affecting it in a way that's that important. But we didn't actually look at mRNA stability. And more broadly, I would say that, although I very much presented sort of this protein stability-centric view, I think our experiment suggests that that seems to be the dominant way that these mutations are interacting with each other over this evolutionary time span. But I, I don't want to imply that I think that there aren't all of these other mechanisms, things like mRNA stability, things like folding rate, things like interactions with other proteins or host proteins that probably aren't also important. And you know, I think if we were to extend our analysis and rather looking at 39 mutations, look at you know, 3,000 mutations, I would expect that some of these other things, which probably are important but less common, would start to show up to some degree. The question, I wonder if you've looked at um, influenza in the population and was the severity of influenza in any particular season correlated with those new T cell epitopes or yeah. perhaps the year before or something like that? Is there, yeah. that, is there there's an interesting periodicity yeah. in that you know, kind of first scan. And I wonder also yeah. if there's some population uh, implications. Yeah, so, so the question is, for example, I've talked about some mutations that were in sites that had a lot of CD8 T cell epitopes. Was the occurrence of those mutations correlated with the sort of the severity of the influenza epidemic in that year? So that's actually not something we've looked at. Uh, my intuition would be that although they probably would exacerbate things a little bit, there's a lot of other factors that are going on at the same time. And people have presented some evidence that major antigenic changes in influenza, so sort of major antigenic drift in influenza hemagglutinin, is probably correlated with more uh, severe influenza epidemics for that year. And so my feeling is that probably because, again, humoral immunity seems to be more important against influenza than cellular immunity, probably any effect of these mutations would be sort of swamped out by that. But I haven't, we haven't tried to look at it in any sort of comprehensive way. Uh, it's certainly probably a contributing factor, but there's probably so many contributing factors that the size of the data set we have now is probably not going to be sufficient to get out any sort of statistically significant correlations. Okay, well, thank you, everyone.